Hey there, Film Buds. Welcome back to the Film Buds podcast, and happy holidays. Uh, I am your host, Paul. And I'm Lauren. And uh, it's our first episode of December, so we're we're also switching into our new theme for the month, which is uh, the holidays. Uh, dear, how, how do you feel about the holiday season? Um... I mean, I like what the holiday season, I think, stands for more than how we've ever executed it in my living memory. Um, You know, it's supposed to be a time of of giving and of thanks and of family, and I feel like it's gotten a little more consumeristic than I would appreciate. But um, I don't know, it's always made these colder months a little bit more warm. No, that's fair. Um, No, I think... uh... The holidays are uh, theoretically a warm time, and I think that definitely um, that warmth and that sentiment is definitely what most uh, holiday films try to tell. You know, things like It's a Wonderful Life and, um, you know, Elf. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these films, the old old, uh, Rankin-Bass claymation things, you know, they sell a certain type of sentiment. Yeah. Um, and so it seemed like an obvious pick, you know, to do a holiday month, but I didn't want to subject us to a bunch of saccharine sweet, poorly constructed and poorly executed holiday films. And I also didn't want to go and and talk about some of the things that everyone talks about, you know, like um like uh you know, like White Christmas or like Elf, you know, because I didn't feel like I really had anything to add to the discussion. What what new can I what new thing can I say about Home Alone? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I decided to go a little bit of a, of a different direction this go round. And so all month long for our holiday theme, we're we're choosing stuff that's, you know, definitely holiday related, but is kind of just adjacent to it. You know, it's it has the themes of the holiday and it's relevant to the holiday in some ways, but it it goes, you know, not so much for sweet sentiment and and warm fuzzies all of the time. It it will have some of that, um, but yeah, we're trying to go in an alternate direction. So uh, our first episode for this month, also because we're currently in the middle of Hanukkah. Uh, it started on, uh... Sunday. It started on Sunday, and it's going to end on Monday. hmm And, uh, so we're right in the middle of, of Hanukkah, and so we decided that for our first episode of the month, we would do a Hanukkah episode. Um, and that was, I think, a better thought and sentiment than content really currently provides for execution of that thought um which is so shocking and surprising how how little hanukkah related content exists considering how much christmas has like vomited over the the spectrum of holiday movies yeah so um the one thing that i knew i wanted to do was a a hanukkah film that uh, I I had known was in existence when I was a child, but didn't see it all, which was uh, Eight Crazy Nights, Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights. And so I was like, you know what, let's go and take Adam Sandler, who I think is a hit or miss um, performer and, and writer for me. Um, his comedy sensibilities work 50% of the time for me, I feel like. Kind of like Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I decided let's go and take this weird animated movie that he did you know before hotel transylvania the only animated thing that adam sandler had done was eight crazy nights and so i thought that it would be interesting to go and do this animated movie that i knew about as a kid that is really like the only big hanukkah movie that i knew um and so that's why it got picked and then i was like well maybe i can find something else and as i'll tell you later it was an interesting journey um, and so our surprise second bonus bit that we're going to talk about is, uh, Rugrats season four, episode one, Hanukkah. Um, and I'm pretty pumped for it. Uh, I think that it's going to be a fun 
episode overall. Um, before we get into it, I guess we should give our listeners who might be unfamiliar with, with Hanukkah a little overview. Yeah, I mean, context is always nice. Yeah. So for those who don't know, um, Hanukkah, uh, its date shifts um, somewhere in between, uh, you know, late November and and the end of December. And so somewhere in that month, it, it usually falls. It's all based on uh, the lunar calendar, if I'm not mistaken. Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe so. Okay. Um, but yeah, I believe that it falls on, uh, it falls in accordance with the lunar calendar. And it lasts for eight days. And the sort of history that that creates the circumstance, right? Hanukkah is a celebration of a past event, remembrance of a past event, you know, celebration and remembrance, um, from about 2,200 some odd years ago. Um, And what happened is a Greek ruler, uh, Antioch IV, I believe was his name, decided to try and force polytheism uh, and deity worship onto uh, Jewish people in uh, Jerusalem and uh, surrounding areas of modern-day Israel. And this also included in Jerusalem the destruction of the main temple uh, to kind of, you know, like really put a stamp out the thing, you know. And eventually it ended up coming and finding its way to uh, this one community, uh, and the the messenger uh, ended up getting stabbed. You know, they say, don't kill the messenger. They disagreed with that sentiment. And uh, they ended up leading this rebellion, and it was this group of people um, who were known as the Maccabees. uh, And it was this group that started out as just sort of farmers and people living their lives and ended up using guerrilla warfare tactics to attack uh, the Greek invaders. And eventually they went to battle with them in Jerusalem and drove them out of the city. And when they got to the temple, uh, the menorah only had enough oil for one day, and they decided to light the thing anyway, and it lasted, the the flame lasted for eight days. And, And so... Now on Hanukkah, uh, there is this uh, ceremonial process of using a a Hanukkah, which is like the little like small at home menorah for Hanukkah. Um, And they have eight candles and a ninth candle that they use as the, the ceremonial lighting candle for all of the others. And they are placed in right to left. Uh, in accordance with uh, how they write and read in uh, Hebrew. And then there are also blessings that are said with the lighting of each candle, and they light them in accordance to the to the newest day. So they write them from right to left, but then they end up uh, lighting them from left to right. Which sounds complicated, but if you play it out like with your hands real quickly, you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> So sit down and just mm-hmm. play it out with your hands real quick. You know, you know, <laughs> so there's like the central candle, then they go out to the to the farthest most candle on the right, and they put that one in first, and then they take uh, the central candle, which they lit in the middle, and they go over to that candle, and then they light it. And then the next day, when they put in the second candle, they'll they'll put it in, but then they'll light the second candle before they light the one that they lit the day before. I feel like that was, was, was a clearer explanation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so they, uh, there's also, um, gift giving every day. Uh, and, and that's sort of a, an overview. They also, uh, ah, aha, because it's this celebration due to the oil, they also will typically fry uh, latkes or donuts um, because they are in oil as a way to, you know, honor and celebrate the oil that stayed alight as well. Which is very common in um, Jewish holidays. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of, like, symbolism. Yeah. 
Um, an interesting thing that I learned today was apparently there are different types of dreidels, and each letter uh, on a dreidel essentially creates the sentence, um, if you're in Jerusalem, a miracle happened here. But if you buy a dreidel anywhere that isn't Jerusalem, uh, it's changed one symbol to say a miracle happened there. Or, if I'm not mistaken, that's the, the sentiment. I do believe so. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, an overview. How'd I, how'd I do? I think you did really well. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, I guess we'll jump into what we're here to talk about, which is, uh, Hanukkah is represented to us in movies and TV shows. And in particular, we're starting with Hanukkah as represented in Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights. And as always, we have a clip, so take a listen. This season, Columbia Pictures brings you Adam Sandler like you've never seen him before. So that was Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights, which came out in 2002. Uh, it's an hour 16 minutes. That's right, folks. It's it's 76 minutes long. Um, and the premise is Davy Stone, an alcoholic with a criminal record, is sentenced to community service under the supervision of an elderly referee. Davy is then faced with trying to reform and abandon his bad habits. It's directed by Seth uh, Kearsley, and it is written by Brooks Arthur, Alan Covert, Covert and uh, Brad Isaacs. And it stars Adam Sandler as Davey, uh, Rob Schneider, Jackie Sandler, Austin Stout, Kevin Nealon, Norm Crosby, John Lovitz, and then it has cameos from several other people, uh, including Tom Kenny and the Sprouse Twins. Uh, dear, do you want to start? I, they've heard me talk for a while. How about how about you kick off with? Sure. Um. Gosh, what do I have to say about this movie? Um. I guess my first thought is like, who you know, who is this movie for? Because it, it doesn't really feel like a Hanukkah movie, even though they keep talking about it the whole time. It doesn't really feel like a redemption story because he sucks as a character pretty much up until the end. And even then, like, it's not really that worth it. You know, I feel like the the town really turns them turns around their opinions about everybody in, in two seconds. Um, And gosh, um... I wish it wasn't a musical. <laughs> uh, no, that's fair. So this movie, you know, the, the, the plot synopsis does a pretty good job of, of getting it. Essentially what happens is this Adam Sandler character, you know, shorts the bill on... He dines and dashes uh, one night, and he almost goes to jail for ten years when this other character also voiced by Adam Sandler, Whitey, uh, decides that he's going to uh, perform a, a miracle for the holiday season um, and help him get on the straight and narrow by making him his, his protege in youth refereeing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, you along the way you learn that he, his parents died when he was a kid on Hanukkah, um, or during Hanukkah, uh, and it was also the night of this miraculous basketball game that he had, and like he's a very good basketball player, and that this woman in the town, um, that he finds attractive is a woman that he used to know when he was a kid. Um, but that he, you know, left her isolated after his parents died. And he's kind of arrested development, you know, stunted person. Um, he hasn't ever opened the letter that his parents gave him for that night of Hanukkah. Um, and um, 
you know, it's that all I think sells what sounds like a promising film. And I think that conceptually so much of this film works in terms of like it has all of the things that a holiday movie needs. It needs, you know, a miracle to happen, right? Because whether it's Christmas or whether it's Hanukkah, both of them have this notion of something miraculous occurring, you know, for for Christians and, and for Christmas, it's the miraculous birth. Whereas with Hanukkah, it's, of course, the miracle of this this reclaiming of their identity and how you know they were able to to make this thing last for so long um in celebration of them finally reclaiming you know their holiest site um and so i think a miracle is necessary to a lot of holiday things um and i think that this definitely has all of the makings for something great where i think it gets in the way is where Adam Sandler usually always gets in the way for me, which is that he doesn't know when to pull back on certain things, and instead oftentimes doubles down on the things that are the worst part of of his story ideas. Um, and so, like, it's a really annoying character voice that he does for Whitey, and it was apparently even more annoying, but focus groups told them so, and so they went in and redubbed it. And so I think that, like, this movie conceptually, great. This movie in ex- execution is a hot dumpster fire. Um, and, like, every time it starts to get good, it completely caves in on itself. No, yeah, I mean, honestly, honestly, every single moment where I was like, oh, this is interesting, and then he was like, oh, what if you got to, like, watch dear shit Mm -hmm. actively Mm -hmm. while while dying laughing because that's what i wanted to watch Mm -hmm. instead of your plot yeah um there are so many cutaway moments you know this is only 71 or 76 minutes of of movie um and it's probably less than that with with credits at the end even though the credits are probably only like a minute but anyway i digress um yeah, it cuts away to, like, the worst parts and the worst concepts of everything that they could be doing, you know? Every time that we could be doing something with characters, we're not. And to your point, yeah, a musical is is great, but also, like, a musical needs to be, like, 90 minutes, or your songs need to be pretty short, you know? Um, but honestly, there isn't anything about this that really needed to be a musical. Um, and... I think it also, yeah, to your point, doesn't really hit on it feeling much like it's related to Hanukkah. Um, you know, the the character Whitey, like, mentions Hanukkah as, like, part of the reason that he's doing this, you know? But then Whitey does not practice Hanukkah. He's not, like, uh, pr- in any sort of way religious. Um, and so he's just bringing it up you know and he even says so they're like you don't you know you you're you're not jewish and he's like oh well you know still celebrating or you know you can't you can still believe or whatever he says i can't remember no um, no it doesn't it doesn't really matter and even their house is decorated so nondescript it's got mm-hmm. a lot of like everything on it it's it's just kind of like the holidays threw up on this house just in a general sense yeah and i guess i wondered why with the the story being that um you know it's this redemption story of of him growing as a person and getting you know the girl of his dreams and and not going to prison for 10 years um at the end is kind of like just masked by yeah. by a whole bunch of unnecessary details that could have been used to further the plot but mm-hmm. Instead, honestly, hinder it at every at every point. You know, I've seen m- musicals of all shapes and sizes, and this one, it was almost repulsively unnecessary. Um, and also, th- they're not some of uh, Sandler's best work uh, in terms of music either. No, 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 no. They're they're really just kind of like we wrote this song. And we didn't edit it, and we put it in this, and then we put it in this musical, 
and that's it. In re- in reality, it was like wasting a lot of time that could have been used for character development and for furthering, you know, this connection to Hanukkah and to the holidays and what the holidays mean. Instead, it was just like, let's watch, you know, Adam Sandler do his worst middle school jokes with a with a budget and a and a interesting cast. Yeah, because um, let me let me say this. One good thing about the film is that like it's. I think really well animated. Um, I think it's actually pretty pretty well done. Um, on a lot of in a lot of scenes, the visuals of it work incredibly well. Um, and I think that on a on a purely visual level, he absolutely conveys everything that he wants to. You know, Whitey covered in shit is just as gross as as the sentence sounds. Um, and, you know, you talk about the deer shitting while they laugh themselves insanely. Like, you know, that's that's exactly, you know, sort of what happens. You know, it's exactly as described. So on a visual level, I think that it's more successful in terms of the, than the narrative itself at, at achieving something. Um, and it's an interesting looking movie, and it's very well animated overall. Um, the big issue with the story on top of it just being sometimes gross for for just potty humor's sake. Mm -hmm. It's also a a redemption story, and I think a redemption story, you have to sell me on him becoming good. And so much of the movie, uh, the Davy character is such an unsavable ass. Uh, And his period of being good, comparatively, is so, so, so short. Before he has his relapse, right? Because we need our third act conflict. Mm-hmm. And so he's so he's so shitty for so long of the movie that then his good period doesn't feel like he's earned how shocking this betrayal is. And so for it to be a redemption story, I think that's a big undermining point to it. And then I think the other big thing is at the end of the movie, spoiler alert... Whitey has always wanted this, like, award that says that he's, like, one of the hardest working people in the town. And they don't give it to him, and Davey comes, and he's, like, I guess just going to apologize to Whitey privately, and then he sees that Whitey doesn't get the award, and in, like, any other movie, this would be the moment where he, like, storms in, and while Whitey is there, you know, demands demands justice for Whitey. Um... But in this movie, they go this weird direction where he stands outside for a really, really long time, lets Whitey leave, then goes in and tells people off, and then they have to go to the mall to, you know, get back to Whitey and to have this reconciliation moment, and then he gets the award at the mall. And so it's it's 71 minutes, but it also feels drug out, and it also doesn't do justice to this sort of redemption narrative either. Because also, they they frame this movie in the synopsis of, of Davy being the main character, when in reality, I feel like the person who gets, like, the, the best ending is technically Whitey. You know, he, he gets, you know, he gets the the miracle he does get his miracle yeah and and davy is is so side charactered that they literally have to make his relationship with with jennifer almost like an afterthought to the point where they don't have any actual scenes together they don't get to rebuild or rekindle their relationship that they had as children instead she's just constantly like in the background watching davy interact with her son but not really being an active character to the point where at the end when he's crying that's the only thing that turns her her around turns her whole opinion about this guy yeah, around because she's never really believed his transformation ever there's no real evidence even when he's being a good person that she's fully sold that he is reformed but then she sees him crying and she she literally is like finally like that's like and then she wants to help him out and thinks that he's reformed like what are you what it just doesn't make any sense. No, it's very weak. It's very shallow. And then they like end up holding hands in the end because like um, Eleanor Whitey's sister, who is also voiced by Adam Sandler, like forces them to like hold hands basically with a threat. She's like, you guys better like each other or else I'm going to drop kick you in the teeth. Mm-hmm. And it just it doesn't it doesn't work. 
it doesn't work at all. And like Davy, Davy sucks for too long of the movie for for any of these relationships to feel earned. And like, yeah, like you said, his his two seconds of being a nice guy and like saying thank you and, and crap after after paying for his meal, like doesn't seem nearly as good of a transformation as he should have had in that moment, especially considering how big of an ass he was earlier in the movie. Like he should have been, it should have been like Scrooge. It should have mm-hmm. been like the end of Scrooge where, you know, he's like, uh, you, sir, you, you boy, what what day is it? It's Christmas Day, sir. And he's like, I'm going to buy that turkey and all of the go get the biggest one. I'm going to let a party happen. He doesn't ever do that in this movie. No. He, not one time. Yeah. And his, his actions are also, you know, I, I don't want to undersell it in any kind of way. Like, his actions are pretty awful, like pretty despicable stuff not even just the dining and dashing and all of that like he's just generally a pretty trash person to everyone and he says and does just despicable things um and i guess it's very it's very mean-spirited for every time then that it wants to be sincere and so the sincerity never lands because so much of the movie is just so mean-spirited feeling yeah, and and basically filled with like 2002's version of fart jokes. Like it's just it it's every time, every time we got something good, it was just smeared with shit afterwards. Like it just sometimes literally. And it just ugh. Uh, <laughs> like I don't understand. Is this is this how Adam Sandler like sees himself? You know, like is is he literally supposed to be Davy? Like, is this us trying to be like, oh wow, Adam Sandler hates himself? Like, I don't, I don't understand who who signed off on this movie. Yeah. Um. Also, as a random aside, it definitely, as you said, um, it does lean more in general. I would say Christmas. You know, like it has a lot more of the iconography of Christmas, and it has a lot more of the plotting of like a Christmas movie. Yeah, I mean, this this movie is basically, like, every time we see any decorations, they're usually, like, Christmas-themed. Everything is, like, red and green for the most part, except for them, like, randomly putting menorahs in places. And so for this to be the thing that a lot of people, you know, have on their list feels like a real disservice. You know, the fact that this is considered, you know, one of the biggest, quote-unquote, Hanukkah films out there feels like a real disservice to, to the holiday that has a lot more, um uh grace and dignity than than this film i think ever really uh fittingly uh gives the holiday no and yeah to go off of your point you know there's one point in the movie where they've got like people at the at the patch party is what i'm gonna call it the gala that they go to and they present the 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 best person award to somebody in town and he's like the mayor goes up there and he's like all right, you know, it's Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas to all those who celebrate Christmas. And like 99.99% of the people at this banquet hall, you know, yell back at him, Merry Christmas. And then he's like, and for those of you, you know, who celebrate Hanukkah, today is the last day of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. And then like three people like say Happy Hanukkah back to him. And it feels like this movie is aware of how Christmassy it is. Yeah, um, but doesn't play with that really either. Yeah, just this random little throwaway this moment. This one joke that's probably one of the better thought out jokes of the whole movie. Yeah. And then again, they ruin it with another song. Yeah. Which felt extra pointedly, like, Jewish. Yeah. I just, this movie is just a, just a mess. Um, I'm going to call it, um, uh, you know, Adam Sandler does his, his best impression of Reb Tevya. Yeah, I was like, it's their fiddler on the roof moment. Mm-hmm. Where they're like literally like, like it's it's so bad. Like, yeah. I don't understand how this is like one of the best things, but honestly, it's like one of the only things. Yeah. Um. So, part of the reason that we ended up also deciding to talk about, and we'll get to in a little bit, Rugrats, is that um, when you look up lists for, I just googled, you know, Hanukkah movies. That was it. And Google provided me like a little list, you know, compiled of data that it gathered from lists that it found. 
And Eight Crazy Nights was on there. Also on there was um, The Hebrew Hammer. Uh, also on those lists were typically uh, Yentl, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, The Little Fockers, Sometimes Meet the Fockers. Uh, one list had American Pickle. Uh, you also saw, uh, oh God, hold on one second. There was like American Tail too. Yeah, American Tail was on there. Uh, so at a certain point, um, it really just became obvious that like the selection was just not really there. Um, Full Court Miracle is one that was there. Uh, the Holiday, The Night Before, Inglorious Bastards, uh, A Serious Man, and then literally A Rugrats Hanukkah. So, like, this is the kind of stuff that happens when you search, you know, just generically, Hanukkah movie. Um, and, like, the BuzzFeed put out a, a list that also included, like, you know, four stand-up comedy specials. Uh, and like an episode of Seinfeld and an episode of Friends. And so, you know, you Google Christmas movie, you're going to have an endless deluge of Christmas movies. We've got so many Christmas movies that we've got a subgenre that's like Christmas royalty romance movies. And I'm over here with Eight Crazy Nights, Fiddler on the Roof, an American Tale and, and Rugrats Hanukkah. Um, and so, like, I was really sort of surprised and, and, and pretty disappointed. I mean, some of these lists had the audacity of just throwing, if a character was openly Jewish, then, like, it just got slapped into the It's a Hanukkah movie. Yeah. Like, the producers, the producers mm -hmm. was on the list. And I just, I, I'm really confused by whose logic that is. Because it's clearly, like, obviously making fun of World War II, but, like, one of... He's like a Nazi. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. It boggles. And so, like, I was, I was suddenly pretty, pretty stunned and pretty disappointed. And, you know, this sort of goes, I think, to that conversation of, that we've had on this show quite a few times before of, you know, the importance of representation. And I think it's just, I think it's absolutely fucking mind-blowing. I, I really can't believe how how few there are uh there was there was stats that were shown uh on the colbert uh show late show a few a few nights ago there's like almost 150 christmas movies coming out this year and they put it as this one article that he he cited as virtually zero hanukkah movies that's how few of them are essentially coming out in comparison to, like, almost 150. That statistically, it's virtually zero. And it just, it just, it's really confusing because Judaism is, is one of our top tier religions. Like, like a third of the people on earth celebrate Judaism. Why are there so few movies about this, this winter holiday? Yeah. So, um... I guess uh, randomly before we get too too much further on into this, because A Crazy Nights is just, it's a mess and it's not a good representation of of the holiday or any holiday maybe. Um, and so before we get get on into into some other things, dear, what do you want to rate uh, Eight Crazy Nights? Um, I'm gonna give this movie a one. Because of its artistry of animation. Um, but other than that, this is literally my least favorite Adam Sandler movie that has ever existed. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I'm going to give it a half. Um, <laughs> Good. Fine. Um, half is, is definitely for the artistry. Um, however, I also did spot that uh, dupe of, Hogan, of, of Hogarth Hughes from Iron Giant. They 100% copied that kid's face for, for a shot in this movie. Um, but other than that, uh, I give it a half for the animation. I would have given it a whole, but then I remembered that Rob Schneider voices uh, an Asian character that they refer to specifically as 
Chinese waiter. Um, and then they also like give him a name later, but his official cast name is, is Chinese waiter. And so I think I'm going to have to give it a half for it just being appalling on, on so many levels. Uh, I don't think that I can, I, in good conscience, give it a whole. Oh no. (laughs) Fine. Fine, I'll I'll second that. I, I recant my one and and mark it off by a half. So therefore, now it is also just a half. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I I think that it's a going off of this. I think that you know I've been I've been to a Hanukkah celebration before, and I think that holidays are, are a lovely time, and I think that people try to to hone in on this one type of holiday movie that's formatted around this idea of of a Christian Christmas holiday and a a Christmas Christian miracle and 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 I I think that it's I think it's a little stale and I think that we've we've really done a disservice by not um not fully incorporating uh Judaism into our cinematic canon considering there are so many people who celebrate it and like i grew up celebrating christmas but like i would never consider myself like a a christian so like i don't under why can't we why can't we be culturally diverse why can't we learn more about each other without having to literally ask the person who celebrates it so how you celebrate this yeah um so moving on we did decide that we would I couldn't I couldn't leave it at eight crazy nights you know I had to do something and so I did think that it would be fun to go in and we're just gonna do a little mini review of Rugrats season four episode one Hanukkah uh it debuted in 1996 it was directed by uh Rami Muzquiz Muzquiz I, I really, I really can't tell I you. apologize for that last name, folks. Uh, I know that I did not get it right. Um, and it is uh, written by Arlene Klasky, uh, Gabor Supo, and Paul Germain. Cool. Um, if I got that middle name wrong, I apologize for that one as well. Um, and the premise is, during Hanukkah, the babies try to help Boris deal with a childhood rival. He is appearing in a synagogue, uh, he is appearing with in a synagogue pageant. Angelica tries to watch a Christmas special. Um, it was so much fun. It's, uh, it's such a good episode. Um... I had a lot of... I, first off, I hadn't seen a Rugrats episode in, like, forever. Yeah, same. Um, so, going back and rewatching it, I just bought the episode because I didn't want to get a Paramount Plus subscription. Um, and so I, like, bought the episode for two bucks. And uh, it was super fun. Um, and And it was... It was just as charming, you know, as any sort of holiday thing should be with, I think, being overly sentimental no i thought that they i thought that they did a really creative job of incorporating hanukkah into the story um and allowing us to kind of learn and discover this holiday through the eyes of of the babies and i think that they do a really great job because like i i loved um you know Stu trying to help out with the pageant even though he's not jewish and like you know trying to to help with you know trying to trying to be supportive mm-hmm. to Dee, Dee and and her family's traditions and like you know just just good all around like wholesome family fun you know i just it was so so refreshing mm-hmm. um yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this episode. I thought it was very sweet and very cute, without being like too, um, I guess, four babies. No, yeah, because uh, there are a lot of jokes in here that that definitely are more for um, adults. You know, Chucky holds up a book and he's like, "Look, a whole book about Plato," and it's you know the the philosopher Plato. But of course, he's coming to it from the from the perspective of it being 
the the fun play putty um and there's a joke where lily and phil uh lil and phil like interact with each other in this time and she refers to him as philistine um and so like that's a joke for for adults that's a little wordplay uh that's only for adults who know what a philistine is um and and so i think that it's like a, a really well done thing right in the end of it it has its miracle in the resolution of conflict you know um and in these two people that had been feuding finally coming together and seeing each other's perspective and you know putting down their swords uh if you will um and it's a nice it's a really nice ending i i quite enjoyed the episode i sentimentality is hard to pull off you know too much and you're cloyingly sweet you know too little and um then it just doesn't seem sincere and i think that they really managed to to sell a very sincere story and also educate you know young audience members on uh the core themes and ideas of the holiday and i thought that it was really successful no yeah um i mean honestly we watched this after watching Eight Crazy Nights, and I knew more about Hanukkah after watching the Rugrats one, you know, in their their loose interpretation of what the story was and, like, our modern traditions of how we, we honor that time and celebrate it than I did from watching Eight Crazy Nights by, like, 150,000%. You mm. know, it just blew it just blew it out of the water and it was a 30 minute special i well i guess i don't even know it was 24 minutes so i guess that's just an average average run you did it guys <laughs> you did it um it's all about economy of storytelling you know it's all about using your time wisely um and so all and you know there's it, it it's it's just it's just good storytelling and that's really all it is you know well and i i remember um i never i've never seen the hanukkah special before i had gone to passover my friend of a friend of mine from from new york was having a passover um and invited me and we ended up watching the the rugrats passover and i just think that the rugrats ha- are one of the few um popular kids programming that that is willing to step outside of christianity for a little bit and i just think that that's so delightful yeah and you know honestly like as a kid i didn't it didn't even really dawn on me um that the family was jewish you know like it it just sort of never even though they talked about it it was never one of the things that really like clicked and stuck with me as a kid you know so they're i think that it's really great at just sort of having but i remembered this episode so, like, even though I didn't really think about them as being Jewish, I still remembered this episode. Um, and so I, I think that they do, yeah, a really successful job of, of just having them be authentically characters, you know, and, and living through it. Um, you know, it doesn't feel hokey at any point or pandering. No, no. And honestly, like, especially going back and watching it now, you know, as, as an adult, it was it was really sweet looking at the, the relationship that Stu and Dee Dee have as as this couple, you know, so often you you look at like couples in something and you go, I don't know what they saw in each other, but you can still see that that spark of love. And that's something that like, if they hadn't have drawn it in, if they hadn't have written it in, if they hadn't have acted it so well, it wouldn't have it would have never been there and nobody would probably would have noticed it, you know, it mm-hmm. not being there. But the fact that these are, these are real people. Yeah. You know, Boris having, having his, his feud, you yeah. know, is, is, is real because at the end when they, they reconcile, they realize that they're, that what they've been mad about is the fact that like they wanted what the other had. Yeah. Yeah. And that's 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 such a such a good message also still wrapped up in like a holiday special. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's also kind of, I guess, the most of what we have. I mean, we could have, I guess, gone gone with full court miracle, but also that's apparently more of just a, a Christmas movie that has some some sort of uh, Jewish flavoring 
and Hanukkah flavoring sort of drizzled on top of it, apparently. Um, so w- there are, I guess, other options that we could have gone, but honestly, it's it's tragically sort of slim pickings. Um, and if I had to, to like, give someone, like, it... Even if you celebrate Hanukkah, if you don't celebrate Hanukkah, I think that I, gosh, I think that this Rugrats episode has more heart and more, more um, good natured, you know, intention behind it. And I feel like, you know, you should bring it into to your personal holiday. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, if you don't know about the holiday, come and watch this. It's it's precious and adorable, and you'll learn while while having a good time. Yeah. Um, so that, I guess, sort of wraps up our, our dedicated to the holiday portion of it. Um, again, for, for those um, who, who do not practice, uh, Hanukkah... Uh, began on Sunday, November 28th, and it ends Monday, December 6th. Uh, so as of this recording and, and when it drops on Friday, we're, we're smack dab in the middle of it. Uh, so also to any of our listeners uh, who are uh, Jewish and celebrating, or Jewish and not celebrating, I don't care, um, happy happy Hanukkah. Yes, uh, happy Hanukkah. Yeah. Um, and I guess from there we we can move on to uh what we've been doing and what we've been watching um yes so as far as what we've been doing we actually were out of town for thanksgiving uh we were visiting uh the thompson side of the family my wife's side of the family um and we went out and we we went to a vintage shop and we ended up finding a whole bunch of stuff at a few different places uh, Lauren got some some old musical records, uh, including a in pretty good shape record of um, the original Oklahoma uh, cast recording. Yeah, I think that this might be my oldest musical record so far. Mm-hmm. Um, at least the the oldest physical copy of of the record like i've definitely seen some some reproductions of it but i've never seen one this old before so i'm pretty pumped about that i i need to put my my collection together yeah uh and then i also managed to snag uh not a not a classic vintage or not a classic vinyl but a new vinyl uh i managed to snag one of the orange vinyls for the halloween kills soundtrack Mm. uh which i'm pretty pumped about Mm, so exciting we also got a few uh movies for pretty cheap um three billboards outside of ebbing missouri uh tomb raider um the original terminator i hadn't gotten it on blu-ray i had t2 but not the first one uh paranorman uh the beatles eight days a week um and then we also got some books uh lauren got a book of spanish plays is that correct Yes, new plays from Spain. Um, it came out in like 2013, I believe, is what the the copyright date on the book was. But I'm I'm super pumped to to read it. I don't personally know any Spanish, but I've also never read a play in Spanish, so I'm I'm pretty excited to to really break these down and and I guess get down and nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I ended up getting two books. I posted about one of them on on the Film Buds podcast uh twitter uh i got two stephen king books a first edition of dr sleep uh and then i got a a hardback of tommy knockers and i wasn't sure at the time that i posted the picture of it whether or not it was a first edition and so since then i've done a little bit of research and it turns out that i did in fact manage to snag uh, a first edition which i'm pretty pumped about um and then in in other things that that recently got here it finally arrived while we were gone and so when i got back home it was waiting for me uh our friend clark collis's book you've got red on you and i gotta tell you folks you know i read it digitally and i saw all of this stuff digitally and i've been seeing people in the uk getting their copies and it's just as good as it looks uh it's a it's a absolutely gorgeous book it's got a red foil lining on the pages it's got a nice 
nice hard back to it. Um, it's absolutely stunning to look at. It's it's really just a just a hell of a thing. Um, and I think that Clark and and everyone should be super super proud of it and how it turned out because this thing is just awesome. Um, and I can't wait to get into reading more of it. Um, no, yeah, and honestly, like worth worth whatever whatever money you gotta spend for it because this thing is it's a thick book. Yeah. Um, and so 1984 publisher is is who it is. Um, uh, or you could go and find Clark Collis, or you could find you know, any of the episodes that we've mentioned, Clark, and there's links usually to, uh, I think actually there's a page that I have that I can link to that'll have like a, a buy page that you could go to. Um, and then in terms of what we've been watching, um, uh, we watched the, the Muppets movie from 2011 recently. Um, talk about a way better musical yeah far more effective oh yeah great um we watched harry potter and the half-blood prince and harry potter and the deathly hallows part one uh which half-blood prince is absolute dreck it's awful um it's the worst harry potter film and i say that wholeheartedly i say that knowing that that Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix ends with one of the corniest lines Harry has ever spoken. Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince is an awful, awful movie, and it's an equally as bad uh, adaptation. Um, <laughs> and and that's all I have to say about that. How do how do you feel about it? Honestly, it's a forgettable movie. It's it's it, the color of brown. Like I'm really I'm really trying to wrap my head around it right now and I'm like gosh I just watched that movie like a few days ago and pff, it's gone it's gone again my brain refuses to hold on to it. Um and Deathly Hallows part 1 is good in the sense that it is being more accurate to the book it is bad in the sense that it is having to go back and and explain certain things for the first time and also introducing some things just haphazardly that were parts of the books that they edited out of the movies for time that now are important and they don't have time for. And so on that level, the fact that it's such an in-depth adaptation after some more shallow adaptations ends up really hindering that film. It's still very good, but I think that because of, of the shortcomings of others, it causes new problems for this movie. No, I think that that's fair. I think that that's fair. It's trying to juggle it all you know yeah um we also watched uh true lies uh the james cameron film recently i was gonna get to it oh okay sorry um and then uh we also watched shang chi recently uh both of which are very good um but the the big one that we watched recently that for me was the surprise winner of like the last week of stuff that we watched uh my mother-in-law, Karen, uh, had her birthday uh, on Monday. And so we decided that we would, would spend it with her, and we decided to watch a movie based on s the work of someone that she shared a birthday with. And so we ended up landing on Joel Cohen, and uh, we decided to do Intolerable Cruelty. It was on Amazon. That was the one that, that Karen picked, and so that's what we ended up doing. And... Um, let me tell you, I had seen that movie before uh, when I was younger. Holds up! I really like it. I know that some people are down on it from the Coen's filmography, but, like, if this is the worst the Coen's can do, jeez, you know? Ah, uh, no, yeah. The, the perfect shot of, like, him going from the dentist to the car to the office. Like, it was so smooth. I loved it. Uh... <laughs> This movie did that so many times for me. Yeah, and it brings his vanity all the way forward with this very simple act of his obsessing over his his teeth um, and his smile. You know, because it's that's 
that's his weapon of choice, you know? That's how he disarms so many people, is that smile. No, this movie is is entirely, like, what I, I feel like I scream from the rafters, you know, show me, don't tell me. This movie constantly was just, like, showing me who these people were with, with how they were dressed, with how they talked, with, you know, how people treated them, and this movie is so campy. I just, I, I absolutely loved it, honestly. I was, I was really pumped, um after reading the synopsis that my mother was still down Mm -hmm. and like uh honestly i was a little bit surprised that she was still down after that opening scene oh oh yeah (laughs) when he's like shooting at her at the car yeah and and stabbed in the butt (laughs) yeah and and he's shouting bitch you know like left right and center i was like wow She's really sticking through this movie, through this first scene. Okay, like, because I didn't remember anything like that from the rest of the movie. And for the most part, like, with the exception of one other little kerfuffle and bit of gunplay, the movie has no other scene that's really quite like that one, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it was a it was a great time. It was a real ride, and I, it was a lovely time, and I'm glad that we got to share that with her. Um and yeah, it holds up. And again, even if this is one of their most conventional films, like this movie's really well done. No, honestly, I think that this is, this would, uh, ugh, gosh, I feel like this is actually why we chose this movie too, was just the fact that like, I feel like this is the most my mother of the Coen's movies that I could have, that I could have made, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I haven't seen The Lady Killers in a while with Tom Hanks, and that might be one that she also enjoys. Um, but no, for for what the Coens typically do, this is the most, like, for your mom those directors get. Yeah, and I, and I guess, like, maybe we should clarify, like, my mother's not really, like, a movie person. Yeah. You know, she she's a if she doesn't like it, we we have a running joke in the family that like it goes by the mom test. And if she falls asleep, then like it didn't pass her test. And she stayed awake throughout this entire movie and laughed and had a good time. And like it, it was fast paced enough that she could keep attention um, with it and interest and the characters. And no, I mean, like, I think that and I guess that's what I mean. You know, mm-hmm. it's. Ah, <laughs> It's it's a family friendly affair. Yeah, honestly, like um it's it does it have language sure, but like for the most part like it's a it's a pretty it's a love story, you know, it's a rom-com. It's a rom-com that is also a little bit of a noir story at the same time and it's it's a really interesting little genre mashup which they do so well. Yeah, and honestly, everybody knows exactly what kind of part they're playing. I think that Catherine Zeta-Jones does a great job. I think that um, his partner, um, whose name I don't know, does a great job. I think that he is super funny. I I wish that I, I knew his name and more that he's done. Yeah, and Clooney lands it. Yeah, Clooney. Well, uh, yes, Clooney is doing a great job. Um, I, This was my first George Clooney movie. Um, Other than like Batman and Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, I guess, you know, yeah, not, not not Clooney doing something that I'm aware of, yeah. like Batman, mm-hmm. but, you know, just, I guess, the Clooney movie. Just a movie, yeah, just a Clooney film, yeah. But, like, no, I, yeah, really enjoyed this movie. Definitely, you know, a rewatchable fun fun fest. Everything is, it keeps, like, trying to one-up itself the entire time, but, like, successfully. It's, it's, it's just so good. It keeps you going on the mystery ride the whole time. No, absolutely. And, um, and the only other thing that that we've been watching beyond that has been get back but we're not done with that yet so i won't comment fully but so far i'm loving the ride on that one oh yeah just a bunch of goofballs yeah just a couple of just a couple of you know young men trying to figure it out and you get to watch them try and and be in this band and make art and uh and it's fascinating and and i'll share more once we get further into it yeah um i'll just say it it's very humanizing yeah, for sure. Very grounding for the Beatles, you know, such a lofty idea, right? To be a Beatle, you oh, know. Oh, yeah, you know, they're rock stars. And, like, we're getting to see them without all the rock and all the star, and they're just dudes. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, celebrities are people, but it it can still sometimes be so hard to 
to separate, especially with since two of the Beatles have passed. You know, it can be so hard to separate the myth from the man, especially since, you know, I'm not weighing who the man was then to who the man is now and trying to, like, extrapolate, you know, how it happened. I only have whatever the past has and whatever people say in the present about two men that are no longer with us. Uh, And so getting to sort of see them in their own world, um, talking about themselves and about what they're thinking, um, yeah, it really humanizes, I think, especially John and uh, and George, um, who I think, because of their untimely passing, have a lot of mythos built up around them. No, yeah, yeah, um, for sure, especially since we are so far removed from this time, and, like, you know, it's really cool to just, like, especially in a time period when, um, like, social media isn't isn't everywhere you can you know flip through (laughs) they're not flipping through their instagram in 1969 and seeing what you know john lennon is up to as he posts about eating cereal today you know no we they didn't have all of that so we did just kind of have all this like um uh collective mythos that we've we've put onto the the shoulders of these people and it was just fun to like you know just hear them chat yeah um I think that's just about all that we really have for y'all this week. We don't have a listener question. As always, um, if if you listeners have any questions or any requests or if any of you feel like we did, um, didn't didn't do Hanukkah justice in this episode, you know, you can always email us at uh, thefilmbudspodcast at gmail.com. Also, go and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for all of the latest news. Um... We're doing a whole holiday month, like I said, and so you can go and check out the the content calendar on Instagram and on on Twitter as well. Uh, we're at the Film Buds on Twitter and at the Film Buds Podcast on Instagram. Um, so yeah, come and come and check us out. It's going to be an exciting month for us. Um, we're we're looking forward to it, and we actually have a special guest plan for y'all for our two hundredth episode. Uh, so so make sure to to come back around uh dear is there anything that you would like to to say to the listeners before we sign off um happy holidays uh stay safe and you know this is a time of 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 remembrance and of of family and of those people that you consider your family you know reach out to somebody that you haven't in a while yeah and uh no i think that that's a i think that that's a lovely sentiment um because you know they they're probably looking to 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 hear from you and maybe if they aren't maybe y'all can figure out why that's the case you know it's it's a time to be good to each other yeah and not just with gifts you know sometimes you being there is the gift yeah um and obviously we should be good to each other all times um but the holidays are stressful for a lot of people and winter is a hard time for a lot of people and so uh let's be good to each other especially as there's there's so many things that are that are stacked against people right now um Happy, happy holidays, as Lauren said. Happy Hanukkah once more. Uh, and uh, be sure to also tune in next week where we decide to look at cinematic takes on Christmas movies from around the world. Uh, Should be exciting. Yeah. Thank you guys, as always, for listening. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.